Hello and welcome to whiskey.com where fine spirits meet. Today I'm in the middle of the highlands. You see in the background there's still a bit of snow. Yes, you got snow in the highlands in May and uh, here and there is a bit of rain and all around me we have a lot of heather. I'm in the Oak Hill Hills which are really famous for their good water. Down in the valley we have a small town called Blackford and Blackford is the home of the Highland Spring Water. Yes, that is a really famous brand of Scottish water and most of that Scottish water is served with good Scottish whiskey. And that's what we're on about today is the Tullibardeen Distillery. It's just right next to the Highland Spring and that they are producing a really nice whiskey. Let's have a look how that whiskey is made. Let's talk a bit about the history of Tullibardin. Tullibardin was first written down in 1488 by King James IV. But you might think, did they have the stilling back in 1488? No, they didn't. It was a beer brewery back then. So they did brew beer here at Tullibardin back in 1488. And King James was really fond of that beer. So they, he gave the brewery a royal charter back in 1503 and uh, this was a really a high honor for the brewery. Let's move to the 20th century. In 1947 they actually reconstructed the brewery and now they were the Tully Barden Distillery. They finished the work in 1949 and uh, started the production back then. Unfortunately, they ran in a bit of a trouble in 1993, so they had to close down and they got mothballed, so no production, only the warehouse was kept um, in good condition. And they did that until 2003, and they got sold to four Scotsmen in 2003, and they reopened the distillery and got it up and running. In 2011, they got sold to a French wine distillery called Picard and these guys really invested into the company they developed the company and back in the days in 2014 the the building behind me was actually a big supermarket called Baxter uh, but the guys at Baxter they did a bit of a miscalculation they calculated 10 buses per day but now nah, they didn't arrive with 10 buses so they went pretty much bankrupt and so the distillery saw that chance and bought the building and now they have a beautiful big building and they don't do the distilling in the building they do like storing all their bottles and their bottling line and a bit of warehousing as well and all the other stuff that is not like the main ingredient for making whiskey so yeah this was about the the history of the distillery and now let's have a look at their production. These are the typical highlands. You have the wind, you have the grass, you have the Oak Hill Hills in the background and the Danny Burn is flowing right through these grasslands. The, the hills have the springs with the water and the Danny Burn flows through the, the fields and they're actually not um, commercial fields so there is no farming there is no livestock, they're just grasslands and that's why the quality of the water is so high that the Tullibardine uh, distillery can take the water directly from the burn and use it in their whiskey production. The water has such a high quality from the Oak Hill Hills that uh, there are a lot of boreholes here on the foot of the hills and they use it for the famous Highland Spring water. It's the, one of the most famous waters from Scotland and is sold all around the world. Tullibardin tries to use regional malt. And the problem with regional malt is that different fields grow different in speed and different in quality and different ingredient. And depending on how likely the malt is uh, turning into dough, you have to adjust the malt mill. The malt mill is a pro-choice malt mill 
an old roller pin malt mill, two-stage process with four roller pills, uh, roller mills, and you can adjust the distance between the pins, and that affects the coarseness of the grist. And here we have the malt, which is the before, and then we have the grist. The grist is made of three substances. You have the husks, you have the, the grits, and you have the flour. And the ratio between the flour and the grits is really important because if you have a, a malt that is tending to form a dough and you have too much flour, you end up with a dough. So what the people here do is they use this uh, little quality tool, the, the box. You fill in your grists, you close the box, you shake it, and then it filters it to your husks, grits, and at the bottom you have the flour. And then you weigh if all the individual parts and then you look what you need to get the perfect stuff for the mash ton. Today they have a malt that is actually forming those pretty easily so they're going down to five six percent flour so they're going really really coarse just now. This here is the mash ton. It's quite big mash ton. It uses six tons of grist and um, you do the washings with 24,000 liters, 11,000 liters, and 20,000 liters. The third run of the mashing is so low on sugar that they can't use it for the whiskey production and they just recycle it and use it in the next batch, batch so you don't lose any of the good sugars. Um, what is really nice here about uh, Tullibardin is that the draft the stuff that is left inside the mash ton that you can't use anymore. They sell it off to a renewable energy plant where they make natural gas and that natural gas is then converted into electricity. Let's talk about the fermentation. The fermentation takes place in nine wash bags with uh, 38,600 liters of capacity and after around 52 hours we are left with a wash of about 8%. Uh, the wash is like a German wheat beer. Uh, it's not as bitter because you don't have any hops. It's just the uh, crushed down malted barley and the water. And what you can see here is because of the yeast, we have CO2 rising and there's a lot of bubbling going on. Uh, most distilleries have blades to cut down on the bubbles or some of them use anti-foam. Here at uh, Tully Bardeen, they do none of that. They just have enough space for safety so it doesn't bubble over. But as we're talking about the very natural product, it may vary. And if you look at the, the lid here and the, the stuff on the side, then uh, it comes up to the very top. So occasionally, if you're really unlucky, it might just go over and then, yep, they, the cleaning crew has to do a lot of work here at Tully Bardeen. But I like it that they go the old natural way. These here are the stills of Tully Bardeen. Since 1973, the distillery has four pot stills. Behind, on the, the far side, are the uh, wash stills. You can always identify the wash stills with the watch glass and the red pipes leading towards it. At the forefront, we have the spirit stills. They have a constriction piece. That means there are many turbulences within the alcohol vapors. And these turbulences called reflux. And the reflux um, makes the whiskey um, condense on the sides of the spills. And then the, they condense and flow back into the pot. And that gives the stillman the possibility to separate the alcohols really, really good. So you can really produce a light and fruity whiskey. So this is what they're looking for. They're looking for a light, fruity and malty whiskey. This is what the spirit of Tullibarden is all about. And they're really down to manual uh, working the stills. So everything is done by hand. Let's have a look how you handle such a spirit safe. So let me tell you about how you manually, the old-fashioned way, do the distilling. First of all, 
you turn up this pipe here, this lever. It opens the valve for the steam and heats the still. And depending on how far you open it, uh, the uh, stronger the pot still will boil. When you have the pot still boiling, you can then turn these levers here. It fills up these tubes and these tubes measure the temperature and the density of what you are distilling after your condenser. With the temperature and the density, you can calculate the alcohol in big tables. And with these, um, with these alcoholic um, points, you can say, okay, everything above this point, this is four shots. Four shots are the fainter, lighter alcohols that are really, really alcoholic in taste that you don't want to have in your whiskey. So they go into the outer bowls, which go into a recycling bin or a recycling tank. Yeah, the, the fangs, the four shots are more like window cleaner. And when you come down to a bit lower then, then you come to the hard piece, the middle cut, that what you really want to have for the whiskey, the one with the really good flavors. Then you turn your lever back into the middle and this goes into the spirit tank. The spirit tank is then later filled into the cask. But then you even measure the other, the other tube, measures them the lower densities. So when you go down to alcoholic strengths of let's say 74, 70-ish in this region, uh, then you say, okay, this is now getting into longer alcohols, heavy alcohols, and they have stronger, bitter, and more robust flavors. And at some point you say, okay, this is too bitter, this is not tasting good anymore, this is not the style we want to have. Tullibardine is a bit lighter, so they have probably a little, uh, a higher low cut. And then you turn this to the side again, and it goes off to the recycling tank, and the recycling tank goes into the next batch of distilling. Here is the cooperage of Tullibardine. Yes, they do have a cooperage on site. And it's a beautiful little building. You have big uh, glasses, glass windows, so you can see out. And the cooper looks out and he just sees casks. Yeah, there are ton, tons of casks stored in the backyard of the distillery. And what he does is he repairs about six to 10 casks per day. But he's not only has to repair the casks, his also his job is to check casks within the warehouse and make sure that you don't have any problems. The leakage is the biggest problem. Most of the, the leaks seal themselves. You have the caramel inside the, the wood and it caramelizes on the outside and seals off the cask. So most of the leaks are no problem. But some casks, especially the older casks, can become more faulty, become bigger cracks and bigger problems. And there's just one cask currently that has yeah, a bit of a bit of a situation going on. It's pretty critical because it's a cask from 66. So what they are looking at, at the, he's thinking about replacing the staves that are broken and uh, he already got um, all the casks that have been emptied and he got ready a 64 and I think a 65. And what he's looking is he will do probably the open heart surgery and replace these staves. So let's talk about how they repair their casks here. And um, they do it really the old fashioned way. They have a driver and a hammer. So what you do is you, you take the driver and hammer and you hammer off the staves until the cask becomes loose enough for you to replace the staves. And you take all the casks that you, or other casks you want to sacrifice and replace the staves that are broken. And when you're done, you get ready uh, a new ring that you hire uh, drive out the old rivets and then take a new rivet in and hammer the new rivet flat so you have a new ring. You set it back on and again then the reverse direction you drive in the new ring and ready is your cask. There are different things you, you have to repair in the cask so you have different stuff to do if you have problems with the bung or something like that but this is generally with the way you did it, do it the old-fashioned way. But Tullibardine is thinking about expanding it a bit. They have a lot of casks on site, so there is probably a lot of uh, cracks and a lot of leakage happening. So they want to expand a bit to get uh, their quality still good 
with their casks so we can enjoy the whiskey in the future. I'm standing here in one of the warehouses of Tullibarden, and this is one of the old traditional warehouses. You have thick stone walls, you have stamped floor, and you have the casks stored not that high. And this is the perfect environment for maturing good Scotch whiskey. It's damp, it's cool, and so it's the perfect temperature to have a slow maturation. And what is really special about Tullibarton is they have a great cask variety. You start off, you have bourbon casks, but you have a lot of wine casks, masala casks, sautern casks, uh, Burgundy casks, Chateauneuf the pub casks, then you have the big sherry casks, and here and there you might have some uh, port pipes. So this is really, really great variety. So you can have a lot of different bottlings. You have the possibility for uh, cask maturation, cask finishes. And this is due to the fact that they have a parent company, which is a, a wine yard, and they can supply them with really good quality wine casks. Um, and here we have one of the very special casks. This is the cask from 2003. This was when the distillery was just being reopened and here we have cask number one. So this is going to be really, really valuable some, at some point of time. And they probably bottle it at the 30th, 40th, 50th anniversary or for, or for another special occasion. So this is it here from the production side and now I'm going to have a little interview and a little tasting about their products. So I'm standing here with Keith Gaddis. You've been here two years at Tullibarden, but you have 25 years of experience in the whiskey industry and you're the master blender at Tullibarden. Thank you very much for having us here. Well, most welcome. I'm delighted that you'll be able to make it along. Okay, so master blender, nice job here at Tullibarden. Um, I'm really excited about the expressions I had, yeah. see how it's being made. What are we having today? So today I thought we'd uh, sample uh, and nose and taste uh, the Tullibarden core range. Mm -hmm. And I think to start off with what we'd like to try is the Tullibarden sovereign. So if you want to pass a couple of glasses, I'll just play a wee shot. And this is Tullibarden mm -hmm. that has been matured exclusively in bourbon barrels. Mm -hmm. So when you kind of nose it at first, at high strength, mm -hmm. you get some kind of very delicate cereal aromas, a touch mm -hmm. of vanilla, mm -hmm. and the effects of the bourbon cask. Now if you'd like to maybe add a dash of water, mm -hmm. I'll just put a little scoot in there, maybe a touch more. Oh, yeah, I do like it that you got, yeah. the, you got like a, a little bit of like... It reminds me a bit of breakfast. Yes. And like with the cereals and mm. that. But like one one of these one of these healthy breakfasts. Yes. <laughs> but then with the addition of the water, what you're getting is the effect of the, the mm. maturation in the bourbon barrels. And a bit more fruitiness as well. Uh, exactly, exactly. Mm. But you're getting a touch more vanilla as well and a touch more kind of coconut aromas uh, mm. and flavours once you try and taste it. It reminds me a bit of I've been around all your production. It reminds me a bit of your your early early wash. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a bit of a, that that fruitiness in there. Okay. Yes. Not not that that you know that yeastiness. Yes. But it's, yes. No. It no. has a bit of a touch in there. I but like it, it. but it's very light, very delicate, and we find it actually an excellent uh, spirit to use in cocktails. We we mm -hmm. we have been working in conjunction with a lot of bartenders mm -hmm. in Edinburgh, for example, who have been using this as a base mm -hmm. of a lot of fantastic cocktails. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I like it. Mm, I like it. It's um, good. You, you feel the distillery character. Definitely. I had, I had a bit of your new make, make, you feel the distillery character. I love it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, so you got to drive, huh? I have to drive. I have to drive. <laughs> so so you got to go with nosing. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So, yeah, as a master blender, I've had a look through your warehouse and the tons of barrels, they're all different sizes and they're yes. all different types and all these wine casks and that yes. kind of stuff. Uh, so the big variety, does that make your job more difficult or more, more easy? How is that uh, working? It can be challenging because if you, you, you 
take in a new type of cask or something that you haven't used before, you have to understand how the cask and during maturation interacts with the whisky. Mm -hmm. But then once you know how it works and the kind of flavour profile that it develops during maturation, you can then use it to your benefit and then regard it as a tool in which it allows you to produce maybe a different expression, something a bit different that the consumer hasn't you know, tried before in the mm -hmm. Taliban range. Ah, I love it. So I love it. So we're going to have one of these special glasses. Absolutely, casts. absolutely. So if I just put these two glasses down here beneath the bar. Uh, the next one that we're going to try is the Sauterne finish. Mm -hmm. So just a little bit about how we make this product. So as with all Tullabard and single malt, the whiskey starts its life in the bourbon barrel. Mm -hmm. But then after a period of time, we remove the whiskey from the bourbon barrel, disgorge the cask, and then we fill it into Sauterne casks that we buy in from France. And what that does is add another layer of complexity to the set of aromas and flavours that you're experiencing with the sovereign. Here, what you should be picking up, certainly a nose is maybe a slightly sweet, kind of more mm -hmm. tropical fruit coming through. And again, when you add a little bit more water, can I just do that for you? Touch more. You see the tropical fruits coming mm. through. Oh, it's getting more intense. Very luscious. Very luscious, mm -hmm. slightly sweet. Mm -hmm. It's a slightly creamy as well. The sautern is a, is that a white wine? Yes. Or, yes. It's, 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 it's a, a white sautern. It's a, it's it's not one of these really straightforward. It's just one of these yes. more delicate, almost a bit like I would say flowery. Or yes, flowery, and it works. It? it works in harmony with the character mm -hmm. that's produced in the mm -hmm. bourbon maturation. You're just adding another le level of complexity mm -hmm. on top of that. Mm -hmm. Nice. And that is called the 228? Why is that called the 228? The 228 really... Uh, 225. 225, sorry. of course. <laughs> the 225, sorry, is a reference to the size of the cask, the mm -hmm. volume that's held within the cask. Mm -hmm. As with the other three, the other two mm -hmm. that we're going to try, ah. the 228 <laughs> and obviously the 500, mm -hmm. is a reflection of the typical size of cask or the volume that's held within each of these casks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is now, you got quite a... Uh, Cool standard range with all the finishes. Yes. Um, but I've seen a lot of other dis um, expressions out there on the market. Of course. So wh where do you want to develop? How are you going to do that? Well, we do a variety of different things just to keep the, the consumer enticed. So, one of the, the things that we've recently done is a set of expressions called the Murray, in which we produce. Uh, a limited batch, maybe once or twice a year, mm -hmm. where we're doing slightly diff different things. Uh, in the past, what we've done is we've produced a, a Murray edition, which is been, has been matured in bourbon barrels mm -hmm. and is at cast strength. So instead of your 43 or bottling strength editions that you normally get, you're getting something a bit different as mm -hmm. a, an interesting proposition to the consumer. Mm -hmm. Our latest release at the end of last year was a Marsala finish. Mm -hmm. So similar to what you're experiencing here, with a, an older Tullabadon, we took it out of the bourbon barrels and finished it in Sicilian Marsala casks, mm -hmm. um, and which for me personally was, um, was today was, my favourite. You know? It was nice. Um, uh, it was really nice, but uh, unfortunately I wasn't allowed to, to do that because my, my father was in, in church for doing the videos about the, the okay, Tullabadon. Okay, so, okay. <laughs> but now that I've been here, now it's mine. Okay, well definitely. <laughs> I'm definitely gonna have the, get that the ones sorted. in the future. So, moving on, we're now mm -hmm. moving on to the burgundy finish. Mm -hmm. And um, if I just pour you a jam. So again, in terms of making it, it's fairly similar, very similar to the Sauterne finish. So again, the Tullabarden starts its life maturing in the bourbon barrels. Mm -hmm. but instead of going into Sauterne, this time around, we're going into burgundy, burgundy casks, sorry, that are supplied by a parent company, Terroir Distillers. Mm, okay. So, so this burgundy is what kind of wine is that? It's a Pinot, I think. Mm -hmm. It's a Pinot. It's a red wine. So what we're getting here is, oh. again, okay. you're getting the initial hit from the bourbon barrels. But on top of this, another layer, maybe Actually, dark chocolate. I didn't get the bourbon ball. I, I got the dark chocolate. The dark bourbon. chocolate. You're getting the, the red cherries coming through. Maybe Turkish delight. That's a, that's a deep one. That's really Thick and rich, deep you know, and rich. Touch, touch, a touch of oakiness in the background. Mm -hmm. And again, when you add water, you just get so much more coming through. Oops. This is one of these after dinner drinks. Definitely. This is definitely one of these definitely. after dinner drinks. Definitely. Smooth, mm -hmm. subtle, very satisfying mm -hmm. as well. But very, mm -hmm. very easy drinking. 
Mm -hmm. Not charming, but again, a whole set of flavours. Mm -hmm. And something mm -hmm. that's a complete contrast to the Sauterne. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay. This is not about the distillery character anymore. This is about, oh, this is the about cask. Mm, the cask. Oh, the cask is amazing. Oh, I love it. Mm. Good. I'm it's glad. a good choice that it's now my distillery to taste. Oh, good. good. <laughs> mm, oh, that, that is amazing. So, um, this one comes from your your parent company. Yes. A vineyard. Um, have you ever been down there and have you ever had a chat with them? How is the, how are they arranged? Are they similar? They, they are fairly similar. You know, we have somebody in charge of quality, a cellar master or mm -hmm. a, a, a master blender over at our, mm -hmm. our cognac affiliate as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I have been fortunate to be down, going down to uh, the, the, the chateau in Burgundy when I first started with the, with the company and I had a, a very good tour around to see their production methods. So, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of wood, yes, they look after their wood, they're very proud of the casks that they use and we obviously benefit when they send the casks up to use mm -hmm. for the Burgundy finish. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, I, I'm about to go on a trip down to Louis Ray, so hopefully sometime soon I can report back and tell you <laughs> how the trip, what the trip was like. Okay, it's, it's amazing that, that you can have such a good connection and, and yes. well, obviously you're benefiting from, benefiting from that really good. I, yes, I, I, yes. I love the, the, the Sotan cast. That yes, was, that and was we like to share our experiences and anything new mm -hmm. that we find, we, we, we share. Mm -hmm. And uh, we obviously uh, benefit from anything that uh, people elsewhere mm -hmm. or my equivalents elsewhere in the company find. In terms of alcohol strength, that you are way above, so it's oh, probably, definitely. Like, yes, probably absolutely. a bit different. But absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. But, but um, in terms of experiences, in terms yeah. of knowledge, in terms of you know, what in, tasks do. In the end, this is all about the flavours. Oh, definitely. And, and so the end result has to be quite, not similar, but quite the... Yeah, same target, good flavour. Absolutely, okay. absolutely, absolutely. So, mm -hmm. to finish off, we have the, the Tully 500, the sherry finish. So this is maybe more of a kind of traditional type of expression where we have taken the Tully Barden out of the bourbon barrels, but this time finished it in traditional Oloroso sherry butts. Mm -hmm. So again, what you're getting is, mm. you know, the, the bourbon style, but on top of that, you're getting maybe the spiciness, the Christmas cake, the raisins and the tannin mm -hmm. aromas that are typical of, you know, whiskey that's finished in mm -hmm. uh, cherry box. Yeah, you get all these dried fruits, Christmas. Exactly, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Again, they don't overpower, so you're getting a very mm -hmm. delicate and harmonious balance between the two different cast types that were used to produce this product. Mm, yeah, nice. Very nice. Again, rich. A touch of oak, but not overpowering, mm -hmm. but very satisfying to drink. Mm -hmm. mm. And the texture is really nice here yes, as well. Yes, so it just coats your the, tongue. You, just you have the flavour, but it's just a, the flavour comes in silky smooth. And Absolutely. I always love about that when you have something in your mouth, it's, it's always about the texture as well. Yes. Um, mm. Oh, okay. Mm. It holds quite long. Well, it I does. Like it. It's long lasting. Like it. mm -hmm. It's long lasting. It uh, mm -hmm. reminds you that it's been there, you know. Yeah, but it's it's amazing that what I always find amazing about whiskey in general is that you have so much variety and you can have so much variety even within one distillery and of course. even with, when you have the sovereign, it's it's light and you have mm -hmm. the 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 white wine you have it was just amazingly floral and uh -huh. you have the other one chocolate and this one is like dried fruit candy almost exactly, like it's, exactly. it's crazy how you can just one product like one yes. product one whiskey and yes. then you have so many expressions and with uh -huh. the Chavonef the pub uh, we had that one quite extensively in Germany yes, and yes. It's, it's amazing uh, yes. I really do love that so yes. yeah thank you very much for all the work you do here and thank you very much for showing us around here you're absolutely so, welcome uh, thanks for for doing all that I'm delighted you can make it <laughs> okay so thank you very much for watching this video if you found this video interesting then please give us a thumbs up and see you next time